The Lord be with you. We welcome you into God's house today. Um, this is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. And um, I'd invite you uh, to stand at this time as we begin with the invocation. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we are humbled by the power of Christ that is made perfect in weakness. Praise be to a merciful God who is our strength and hope. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my right 
righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Your sin runs deep. Your grace is more. Your grace is found. Is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Where you Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Oh, God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, Oh, God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And, and the truth is not in us. Your people, O oh God, were a rebellious people in Ezekiel's day. Hear the good news. In great love, God sends his word of mercy and forgiveness. Now he uses his word and sacrament and one another to assure us of the grace that is readily available to us. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.
Our first reading for today is from Ezekiel in the second chapter. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading for today is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. It also serves as the basis for our sermon. Paul writes, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man cannot utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand in honor of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for today is according to St. Mark in the sixth chapter. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No, No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick 
and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated at this time, and before our sermon hymn, I'd invite all the children, uh, if you wish, to come on up for a little children's message. Come on up. Yeah, if you guys want to sit in these chairs or in those chairs, just don't sit on any keys if you see any keys there. Yeah, come on up. Olivia, very good, very good. Yeah. Benny and Amos, are you guys going to come up? Nah, probably not today. That's okay, that's okay. Yeah. All right. I want to tell you and you and you um, a little bit about what the sermon is about, okay? The sermon is all about forgiveness. All right, so I'm wondering, have you ever been told by your mom or your dad, all right, you need to say I'm sorry to so-and-so, your sibling? Have you ever done that? Yeah, probably not, but I know that I've had to do that with my boys, right? Every once in a while, dad has to go and say, now you need to say, I'm sorry. And what are you supposed to say? If somebody says, I'm sorry to you, what are you supposed to say? Caleb, do you know? Yeah, what are you supposed to say if somebody says, "Mm mm-hmm? Well, as apologize means I'm sorry. And Faith, could you say that again? What are you supposed to say? I forgive you. Yeah. That's what I teach my boys to do. If somebody, if, if, uh, if their brother says I'm sorry to them, then they should say I forgive you. But here's the point of the sermon, is that sometimes your mom and dad have to do that too. I remember not too long ago where one of my boys was up on the hill and I thought, good golly, Miss Molly, something's not right up there. And I say, get on down here and do what I'm asking you to do. And then they come down and they run down. And they say, well, Dad, I was doing that. I was doing what you asked me to do. I was picking the stuff up at the top of the hill. And you know what I had to do? I realized that I had to say to my son, I had to say, I'm sorry to my son. And so, you know what he said after I said, I'm sorry? He said, I forgive you. You see, that's one of the points of the sermon, is that Sometimes even moms and dads have to ask for forgiveness. And it's not just sometimes, it's all the time. Everybody needs to say, I'm sorry. And we all need forgiveness. All right. So, I'd invite you to uh, practice that. Turn to a person that's next to you, or behind you, that you're sitting on the lap of. And turn to them and say, I'm sorry. And then, and turn to that, if somebody said, I'm sorry to you, then you turn to them, and what do you say? Let's all say it together in a confident voice. I forgive you. Very good, very good. You can go back to your seats as we sing our sermon song. Deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing love. The Father turns 
turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders Ashamed that hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection, why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my land. His wounds have paid my ransom. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our sermon text for today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the end of the the second letter that Paul writes to the Corinthians, the end of our sermon series, listen to the words that Jesus speaks to Paul in a revelation of surpassing greatness. He says this to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul writes, I will boast all the more of my weaknesses, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Our text thus far. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are at the end of our sermon series called Yet, where the premise is that throughout Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, Paul will often put two seemingly contradictory truths right next to each other, often saying them in the very same breath as he confesses the truth of the Christian life. Two contradictory truths held at the same time. F. Scott Fitzgerald writes about this kind of a concept in an autobiographical kind of an essay he wrote in 1936. Uh, that essay is called The Crack Up. Uh, and I quote him here. He writes, The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time. To hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. He goes on, One should, for example, be able to see that things are in fact hopeless, and yet, right, there's our word again, yet, yet be determined to make them otherwise. End quote. To hold ideas opposed to each other, to hold them at the same time, to retain the ability to function, even when you see the world is hopeless, yet retaining hope. Tensions that we've explored so far are afflicted, Paul calls us, yet glorious. He says that we are in our bodies at home and yet away. 
And he says the week after that that we have nothing and yet possess everything by the grace of our God. He says last week that we are poor, yet we are rich. And now we explore these opposing truths. That Paul, at the end of his letter, confesses that he is weak, yet strong. At the same time, weak, and yet strong. And Paul goes beyond that even to say at the end of our reading for today that not only weak, yet strong he is, but when he is weak, in his weakness, there he is strong. And so I want to prepare you as we, go to, as we go to this text and as we study it. I want you to be thinking in your mind right now. I want you to think and to remember a time when you felt weak. All right? Think back to a time where you felt like you could not cut it, where you were not enough for the challenges that were before you. Think back to a time, hold it in your mind, when even the thought of being part of the solution seemed to be beyond you. I'll tell you about one of those times in my life. Uh, I remember a particularly broken relationship that I had gotten into the middle of. As a pastor, you get in the middle of a lot of things. Uh, and I remember this particular relationship. I remember trying this and that with these people who were in conflict together, but nothing really seemed to work for them. And I remember getting to the point after months of walking with them when I felt as though I was actually becoming more of part of the problem than part of the solution. I was finding myself not really able to see any way out of this for them, starting to realize, at least from my vantage point, that it looked like a train wreck that was just going to happen, that we were all just going to take the hit. And so the question that I ask you is, for Pastor Muther in that chapter of life, what do Paul's words mean? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Be thinking about that as we go to our text. Paul begins this chapter by telling a story. A story that he could boast about, right? You see, the false teachers at Corinth made quite a big deal about their pedigree. They had education, they had credentials, they had lineage on their side. They looked like the kind of people that should be teachers. The false teachers also made a big deal about their spiritual gifts. They said that they could teach in tongues, they could speak in tongues, they said that they had dreamed dreams of surpassing greatness, revelations given to them from their Lord. And Paul says at the beginning of this chapter, hey, I could boast about that too, and I wouldn't be wrong. Then he tells a story about himself. It's about him even though in our text he says it in the third person. He does that so that he distances himself from this story. But he says, I was caught up in a vision of heaven. Caught up to the third heaven, that is the highest of heavens, and caught up to paradise in hearing the unutterable excellencies of God. Just like all the false teachers and false prophets that have been sent among you have said, I could tell you that story, but let me tell you another story. Let me tell you a story about my weakness. And Paul goes on to the bulk of our reading. He goes on to recount a story of suffering, a story that continues with pleading with God on a regular basis. And he ends that story with an ending that is not so happily ever after. You see, Paul writes in our text that he has a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan sent to harass him. We don't really know what that means. It could have been a physical thorn in the flesh. It could have been an injury from his many bouts with death. You remember he was lashed within an inch of his life multiple times. He had been stoned near death by the Jews. He had been in hardship in many places. And certainly all of those would have left scars and aches and pains on his body, to say the least. It could have been that. It could have been a disability of some sort. 
Some of the extra biblical texts that we have uh, would suggest that he may have had a stutter or a speech impediment or a tick of some sort. We don't know. It could have been a mental or a psychological thorn in the flesh. It could have been guilt or fear or regret over his past. He had much in his past that he could have regretted at that point. We don't know what it was. But this we do know, that he consistently and passionately pleaded that God would take that away from him, that it would no longer be a part of who he was. And we know the reason why he asked that, not for his own comfort, so that he could live out his days in niceness and security. Instead, he was asking this for a really good reason. He was asking this so that, free from his impediment, he could do more work for the gospel. Now, that's the kind of story that you would expect would end in glory, right? Right? that would end in a happily ever after, that God heard this righteous plea from a righteous man and he vindicated him from this messenger from Satan. But that is not the case in our text. Instead, we find that Paul continues to suffer, presumably for the rest of his life. No, the vision that he does relay, a vision, a revelation from Jesus' own words that he does give to us in place of the false prophets and their visions, he says Jesus said this to him, Paul, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Jesus said, my power is made perfect. That's the same word that he uses upon the cross, to telestai. It is finished. My power is made perfect. It is made finished. It is completed. It is come to its end. Now listen close, right? Because this is the heart of it all. My power is completed in your weakness. In. Not despite of your weakness. Not in lieu of your weakness. Not except for the parts and the places in your life where you are weak. No, his power is made perfect in your weakness. Paul says it a different way, proclaiming the gospel in Philippians 2. He says it like this in Philippians 2 about Jesus. For Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. He emptied himself of his power. He made himself weak, becoming a servant, becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross. So, if our salvation came through Jesus humbling himself to the point of death, how much more will we be going about our business seeing his strength made strong in our weakness. For when his power is made perfect in my weakness, then that means when I am weak, when I am weak, there and then I am strong. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, this is the the remarkable self-forgetfulness of the gospel. This is the remarkable turn the world on its head nature, the radically different nature of the Christian life and the gospel, that when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, the gospel does this to the life of a Christian. It takes every awkward foot-in-the-mouth moment where you call Sean Eric, for example, and makes that a moment when you can go back to that person and apologize and invite a deeper conversation. The radical nature of the gospel is that every one of your missteps becomes another time and another place where you can clarify that we are here to build the kingdom of God both in our success and in our failure. It means for Pastor Muther, it means that every time that I mess up in front of my kids, and I do, 
Every time I lose my temper, every time I don't act right, every time I see a situation and misassess, every time I get it wrong is just like the times when I get it right. It's another time to model to my children and to receive from them the very same thing that I give to them when they mess up. I, right? Pastor Dad, I have the amazing privilege and joy to hear my kids proclaim to me the very best thing in all of the universe, the forgiveness of my sins. I cannot think of a more awesome, humbling, and amazing grace that a knucklehead, ding-dong old pastor dad like me can have than to hear the words of the grace of God washing over a multitude of sins from my mouth or from anyone else's. It's like this old hymn writer would have said, amazing grace, how sweet a sound. How sweet a sound that would save a ding-dong old knucklehead like me. I regularly get lost. I regularly even wander away. But now I am found. My wife will tell you that I'm blind in lots of ways, particularly blind when it comes to where the leftovers are in the fridge and where the, where the mustard ran off to in the door of the fridge. I am blind, yes, but now I see. When I am weak, then I am strong. This remarkable phrase of Paul strips us of our shame. It reminds us not to pray that we do everything perfectly in this life, but to pray that we would work with all of our might and that God would use both our success and our failure so that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, Paul's phrase not only strips us of our shame, it invites us to be stubborn about the right things. When I think about that, I think about a couple I had in premarital counseling several years ago. In the first session of premarital counseling, I ask all kinds of nosy questions about families and upbringing and what your home was like and this, that, and the other thing. And on the last page that I fill out, I turn to one and I ask this question. I ask, what do you love about your fiancé? What are the top three strengths of your fiancé? Tell me that. And after both have a turn to answer that, then I ask the other person, I, I ask each person another question. Okay, those are your fiancé's strengths. But what would you say are your own weaknesses? Where do you fall down? Where do you fail? Remember one particular couple that did what all the other couples do. Uh, they hem and they haw and they can finally scrape together two or three things about everything. And I write down their answers and I leave the room as I ask them to pray for each other and give them a little time and space to do that. This particular couple, they stood up and they got out and I went back to my office to tidy up and get ready for the next thing I was going to do. I looked on my sheet and I had seen that the German Lutheran dairy farmer kind of a guy had taken my sheet and he had crossed out all of his weaknesses and he had wrote one word, all caps, stubborn. <clears throat> so I invite you today, uh, to do the same thing that I invited him to do in his wedding sermon, that he would be who he is, that he would be stubborn, but that he would be stubborn about the right things. Today, I invite you to be stubborn, to be stubborn about the right things. Do not be stubborn about having your own way, but instead, be stubborn to confess your sins without reservation to confess your sins whenever you are confronted with them. On the one hand, do not be stubborn to remember somebody else's fault and the griefs that someone else has made you bear, but instead be stubborn, absolutely stubborn, to forgive them again and again and again so that the grace of God may wash over all that is good, all that is bad in this world and turn it into the good of Christ. Do not be stubborn to look at the hopelessness and the despair that is so readily and easily easily available around you. 
Instead, be absolutely stubborn to remember that the Lord of heaven and earth is your help. That the God of Jacob is your fortress. And when you're in him, you're never ever going to be shaken. Even if the whole world is falling away. Be stubborn in the face of every truth that you might see with your eyes in this world. Be stubborn to look again with eyes of faith. Be stubborn to remember and confess that when I am weak, when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen and amen. Now may the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God. As we turn to a time of prayer, I'd invite you um, to keep in your prayers this week the family of Nancy Burkett. Uh, Nancy passed away last Saturday and was laid to rest on Friday. Uh, we also keep the Yatka family in our prayers at the passing of Michelle's mom, Kathy. And uh, we pray for a few of our In His Arms people, uh, uh, the family of Anthony Hart, uh, he has a son in our In His Arms classrooms. Anthony died very unexpectedly this last week, leaving his family without a dad. Uh, the other uh, is a, um, Kelly, Kelly is one of our uh, staff members at In His Arms. Uh, she and her husband uh, were, are newly married, but on their wedding day, her husband collapsed, and now he's in the hospital. We pray for them. Let us pray for the church around the world and for ourselves and our nation, and for all people in their various circumstances, for, pre for peace and harmony between nations, for human rights, freedom, and justice in our nation, and for people everywhere, for bountiful harvests and an end to malnutrition and hunger, for human dignity, and ample clothing and shelter. Lord, hear for wise leaders, alert armed forces, and compassionate first responders. Lord, hear for the bold proclamation of the gospel and compassionate care for the poor. Lord, hear for new insights into the workings of God's good creation. For answers to the prayers of all those who are named in our bulletin those, O oh Lord, who are suffering in their body, for the families that are grieving in these days, especially the family of Nancy Burkett, and for Michelle Yatka and her family, for the family of Anthony Hart. We pray for all who call to God for healing, for comfort, and for any other need. Lord, hear
for these and any other things you would have us ask, Heavenly Father, that you would grant them for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, You may be seated. Please stand. We pray. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created, sending prophets and martyrs to proclaim your holy will and call your people to repentance. And in these last days, sending your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in his name, we ask you, grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood in this foretaste of the heavenly feast to come. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship. With the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God. Worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Please stand. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that the lips which have sung your praise in the sanctuary may glorify you in the world, 
that the ears which have heard the voice of your songs may be closed to the voice of clamor and dispute, that the eyes which have seen your great love may also behold your blessed hope, that the tongues which have confessed your name may ever speak the truth, and that the bodies of all who have tasted your Son's living body and blood may be restored to newness of life through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. We are weak, yet made strong by the power of Christ and his unfailing love. May you find peace among your troubles, knowing that his grace is sufficient for you. Join us in proclaiming the great love of our God and his grace that is so lavishly poured out on us. Please sing with us on your graces and mercies. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Yeah, your grace is enough. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. God, I sing your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me, for me. You may be seated. God bless your July 4th weekend and all the activities therein. Uh, we thank God for our nation and for the way that the sacrifice of those who have gone before us draws our eyes to the greatest sacrifice of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. Uh, a couple other announcements before we get going today. First announcement is there is a bulletin board with things to sign up for on VBS, uh, for VBS. Uh, and it is over there. Needs are there uh, both volunteer and for donation as well. 
So please take a moment to check that out. Second announcement, oh, and BBS is the second week of August, second week of August. Two more sheepdogs, two more crew leaders. Yes, just getting people from place to place. Very good. Um, other, another announcement is that two weeks from now, July 18th, two weeks from now, uh, we're not going to have 1045 service in our sanctuary. Instead, two weeks from now, July 18th, we're going to have 1045 service at Riverside Park. Riverside Park. And I believe there is a potluck afterward, potluck to follow. So uh, <clears throat> please do feel lucky that day. Bring something to share. Um, <clears throat> uh, one other announcement that I can think of um, is that we did start to have a fellowship hour before the 1045 service. So if you're interested in uh, snacks and and uh, iced tea and uh, coffee and uh, cupcakes, at least there, you could be interested in cupcakes this last time around. Uh, feel free to come early, enjoy Bible study and whatnot. Are there any other announcements that you wish to have announced? Ah, yes, Faith. What are your jokes today? How do you get rid of water? How do you get rid of one? I don't know. How do you get rid of one? Oh, oh, oh add a G. <laughs> joke number one. What's joke number two? What has keys but can't unlock a door? I don't know. A piano. Hey, yo. <laughs> Good job, Faith. <laughs> Please do know there are many ways to connect, including uh, giving to an orphanage in the Middle East, as well as many places uh, to, for service that you can find in your bulletin as well. God bless your week.